Hi, Denise. Hi. I'm so Hi. glad I finally got you on and we get to chat about this beautiful, beautiful work. I'm going to put this, I had it back here and then I took it down during our technical issues because I wanted to take a picture of it beside my cocktail. And what are, um, what are you drinking? I'm drinking a Tom Collins, which is my favorite cocktail. And I was like, is this, in a, is this the right, the right cocktail for a noir? I don't think so. Mm. No? I was like, should I get a Negroni? I don't love Negroni, but I was like, the aesthetic would work, right? I'm oh, not I sure. A, I have a mocktail amaretto sour. Oh, oh, nice. Which is appropriate because it's a bit sour, but then there's a little sweet thing at the end. Because there's okay, that's good. cherries in it. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, nice. Okay, well, cheers from across like whole whole different miles and miles and miles away <laughs> i'm so excited to talk about the second murderer um for those we can just jump right in uh for those who don't know the second murderer follows the search for a missing sociolite through the gritty los angeles backdrop perfect for noir the interesting fact about this book is that it's a recreation of raymond chandler's famous philip marlowe detective and you're the first woman who's ever recreated this detective so i'm kind of just going to jump into why 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 this raymond chandler detective and what made you interested in pursuing this particular story well the estate asked me if i would do it and i jumped at the chance oh nice yeah i was so keen to do it and uh, i didn't even really know what the deal was you know because it's quite kind of mysterious that sort of estate world and uh, can you hear my dog yeah yeah it's cute though I like and it. uh yeah the whole family are helping me today by oh, keeping the dog nice. away from me um but uh yeah so i was desperate to do it and one of the reasons was i love chandler so much but if you read him now he's quite hard to read because he's very misogynistic and you know he's always slapping women and um particularly in the later books he's incredibly racist and he's very homophobic but i still love him and i love his writing and i think he was um a bigot of his day and, uh, and, you know, I really wanted to kind of update all those values and think about what Marlowe would have been like if he was alive now. Because, you know, he was such an interesting character and it's such a brilliant world. I mean, it's early on the brink of massive social change. It's quite a kind of rural, kind of undeveloped place at the time. It's just before lots of people moved there after the war and there, were lots of, there was lots of money flooding down from Chicago and... Um, you know, it was a real kind of idyll at the time. And uh, so I was desperately keen to do that. And I really wanted to take some chances with Marlowe and um, update him and make him marginally less offensive. I mean, okay, so I read a lot of of people talking about this book um, to, to get sort of an outside perspective because I'm pretty biased when it comes to this. I think it's great. But I did read a review, a review that said, um, is it heresy to say Denise Mina's Philip Marlowe novel is better plotted than Raymond Chandler's? Stuart Kelly said that. I mean, from James Patterson to this, I don't. I think that the way that you're telling the story is incredibly intelligent and quick-witted and smart. So, I mean, you're in Scotland. How, what have you been to LA? Did you go there to write? What was it like getting? And I feel like probably very far away from how what day-to-day -day life is like in scotland to absorb yourself in this in this sort of los angeles dark noir type of writing well i was gonna come to la obviously i was gonna get an oldsmobile i was gonna drive around uh, i was gonna get you know really stuck in and then COVID hit so i just had to uh -huh. so i just oh, had man, to use yeah. my imagination you know and uh and I mean, I have spent time in LA and been very confused by LA. Um, it's, you know, when, you, when Europeans go to a city, we drop our bags and we go for a walk. Which... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. In LA? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I imagine. Did that, I did that in Arizona and, and the, the park rangers almost had to come and get me. I didn't know why, oh, no. I, didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know why truckers were hooting at me. And they obviously thought I was like a roving lady of the night walking along, <laughs> walking along the road. Well, I was just, I was waving back. I was like, hi, yeah, people are friendly here. Um, but it's, you know, it's so different, just the geography of the city from the way we imagine cities in Europe, because everything is pedestrianized. So 
Um, having spent a bit of time in LA, I was quite intimidated by that. But I think really that that LA of that time is, is as distant to people who live in LA as it is to me here. The only difference is imagining being warm. That's the only difference really. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, you know, and, uh, and there's loads and loads of documentary evidence. There are brilliant um, films online of people put big movie cameras in the front of cars and, you know, they drove around Bunker Hill. So you know exactly where all the buildings are. You know, you know when it's slightly melting around that time. Uh, like all these falling down mansions and you know some of them have been knocked down their car parks now and um the you know just like uh, plots of brilliant public buildings and then just nothing just like mud and um uh, i particularly found um at all the stuff I, I read about um sunset boulevard really amazing um because it was really a bridal path for a long long time and uh, everyone north of there, there was all the movie stars and they all had stables and horses. They all went horse riding and uh, there really wasn't that much to do. But mostly my geography came from Chandler. So there's a great guy who That's does these maps of Chandler's LA. And you know, it shows you where the dancers are and shows you where his offices are. And um, it shows you where Chandler actually lived and all the houses he rented because he just rented houses all around the place because it was so cheap to do um so and you know like documentary film of skid row at that time so there's loads and loads of documentary evidence which is probably more useful than actually going to la and doing the doing the roots yeah i think someone has a question do you copyright your material i think i think yeah i mean all books are copyrighted but um so but that's such an interesting question in the context of an estate novel yeah. Was very what was that? What was that like? What they just approached you via email? Was it like? Was there a specific and reason why they approached you? I'm curious. I don't think that I've ever interviewed someone who this is this has sort of happened to. So tell me more. It's so interesting. Like, right? so I thought. Do you remember when Faye Weldon wrote a Bulgari book? She Faye Weldon got. Um, a contract to write a Bulgari book. Bulgari's like jewellery and she had to mention Bulgari jewellery every so often in the story and I think they paid her a huge amount of money. I thought it was quite an interesting model because it's a different way of funding writing and I think we should talk about the money much much more in writing because it's always very mysterious you know so what happened was they said would I be interested and I said I would give my eye teeth to do this uh, and they said well you, would do, you don't need to do that you know um, and uh, they said, what we would like is a couple of sample chapters to see if you've got the voice or you can do the voice. Um, and we would like an outline of the story. So that was basically what I did. And then they said, yeah, we'd really like you to do this. So I met with the board of trustees of the Chandler estate. And I said to them, I'm so interested in what you're doing because the book is about artistic estates. Um, I, I, you know, I'd like to interview you all. Is that okay as part of the deal that I get to interview you all about your role, how you came to it? Anyway, they let me do that, which was brilliant, you know? And, uh, and then we took that, that, the permission to use that character, we took it to different publishers in, in the UK and in America, and they basically signed a contract. It was just like an advance for the book. And part of that money goes to the estate, but it's a very small amount. But actually the copyright stays with the estate because it's pre-existing characters. So I was quite keen to use as many pre-existing characters as possible. And uh, um, just to, you know, you're not going to get the chance to use Anne Reardon again. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I really wanted to kind of use um, everything that was available there. But it's, I mean, it's such an interesting process and it's all kind of uh, glossed over in a very mysterious kind of way. I think it's fascinating. I agree. I mean, you mentioned about capturing the voice and that was something they were looking for. Did you have to, was that a challenge or was it something that came innately to you? I think a lot of people read Chandler for the prose and I imagine it was a bit challenging because, I mean, the prose are fun, a little funky when you read them nowadays, but they're, they are quite beautiful. So if you, you know, look aside some of the other problematic issues, they are going to be quite beautiful prose. I mean, I think that what is great about Chandler is first of all the prose style and second of all he had this kind of Brechtian approach where every scene stood on its own that's why his plots are kind of a bit jonky um, but to get the voice I, 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 I read all the books again and then I listened to them on audio 
and there's a brilliant guy doing the audio and that really gives you the flavor of it and then actually i did a diagram of a page at one point because i'm a fiend for commas and he didn't use a lot of commas <laughs> <laughs> it's very staccato you know and so i sort of did a diagram sort of morse code diagram of this punctuation on each page to have some idea of how often he used full stops you know how quickly he went into other paragraphs his descriptive paragraphs can be quite a long. lot that's yeah. a lot of research yeah it was a lot of research i love research do you like research <laughs> about you i mean i think, I think it depends on what it is market research i can do that type of research like going into the nitty-gritty oh i think i'll need a lot of coffee maybe <laughs> I some cocktails <laughs> <laughs> i love that stuff <laughs> So, um, we had a question from earlier. It says it reads like you had fun writing it. Did you? I had a ball writing this book. Really, just, you know, being back in that world and imagining how smelly everybody must have been. <laughs> I mean, when, you know, when I was young, I smoked really heavily. Everyone smoked. Everyone stank of cigarettes all the time. And they're not having showers every day. And it was during a heat wave that actually happened then. Um, just trying to sort of put yourself in that world and um, fully inhabit it. And the clothes the women wore were amazing. You know, they, they were, all, the, all the clothes, the skirts were all weighted. They had little weights in the hem to hold them down. Oh. You know, their undergarments. There's a great woman on Instagram um, whose account I think is called Clothing Through the Ages. And she actually shows you the undergarments everybody wore at the time. They had like three sets of clothes on these women. They weren't wearing yoga pants and a t-shirt. They were like, re like really going for it. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah, I'm uh, glad I was born in this generation. Yeah, that sounds rough. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much <laughs> yoga pants and dirty t-shirts. Same. <laughs> so, but I did. I had an absolute ball right now. It was great fun. That's awesome. I somewhat another question. People are coming up with this and someone says, it looks like a knife is missing from the rack behind you. Should I be worried? <laughs> 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 I think that was intentional. Leave us with a bit of intrigue. <laughs> if I turn it around, you can see how messy the other side of the kitchen is. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> I I'm in the middle of, of packing, so I have books everywhere. And before I had to a couple of times check my camera angles because it's chaos. <laughs> <laughs> During lockdown we did this thing, um uh I can't remember what it was called, shelf isolation it was called and it was a live tv show and just to cheer everybody up i spun my camera around in my office because it all looked very nice and I had a fire going and it was just like paper and paper and paper and maps of la because i was in the middle of writing this book and um people said it was a high point of the first lockdown because uh, they knew other people were you know <laughs> <they're tidying. laughs> so how long did this book take you to write you know, that's always such a hard question. And the way people answer it's always really telling. So sitting down to write, it took about four months. But there was a lot of research before that, an awful lot of research. And, um, you know, I hear some writers who wear it really lightly. And they always say, uh, it didn't take, you know, it took me two months. But I know that they did an incredible amount of research before that. And I, I always think there's writing, but there's a lot of circling the desk before that, you know. And, that. You know, getting the bit, getting the pencils right, and thinking about it, sitting down, having a false start, going back to it. Um, but actually, once I started writing this, because I had to put the structure in, I had to put the story in, um, I went through and I wrote what happened in each chapter. And then I tried to do it the Chandler way of making each chapter stand on its own. And one of the lovely things about Chandler is no one ever goes anywhere. People are just places. They just turn up in places and, uh, and things happen. You just get straight to the, the action. So that made it feel really, uh, you know, exciting to write. You never felt you were writing bridging passages or, you know, trying to explain how somebody caught the bus. They just arrive. Nice. On the, on the topic of research, what's, I feel like this is a loaded question. I'm sorry, yeah. in advance. What's the most interesting thing or things that you learned while you were doing research for this book? Well, actually it was <laughs> like i've home. got a list <laughs> oh, I have, I, I, i'm such a nerd i'm sorry you'll have to stop me um the gay scene in la at that time was so vibrant and alive and actually i saw at pride this year somebody was complaining that there were no lesbian bars in la no 
But at that time, you know, because everything's so kind of, you know, borderless and heteronormative and kind of non-binary now. But at that time, the lesbian bars, they had their own cabaret circuit. They had, you know, uh, there were different types of, there were butch bars, there were uh, femme bars, there were mixed bars, uh, there were sort of glamour girl bars. Um, they didn't let men in. And so, but they would let men in to the bar. They could look through a mesh and they could watch the women, you know, sit and drinking. For, for yeah, for, for a few dollars, they could do that. So that's always been going on. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it's just that kind of, you know, and in fact, there's a character in it called Jimmy the One, who's an out gay guy who's not sorry. And that's why he's called Jimmy the One. And Jimmy the One was actually a very famous character in Glasgow. He was a gay guy in Glasgow. He was out in the seventies, early seventies. And uh, so I want, and he died just during lockdown. And I wanted to kind of commemorate Jimmy the one in this book by putting him in the place he wished he'd been born and in the body he wished that. he'd had and uh, to give him the background that he'd had because he was just such a, he saved so many lives, that guy, just by being himself. He was a, he was a lovely person and, um, uh, and I think he would be thrilled. And every so often someone in Glasgow reads it and comes up to me in the street and says, thank you for Jimmy the one. Because he, he was one of those kind of he was one of those kind of people that everyone will forget about in in five years time. Do you know what I mean? I just really wanted to commemorate him in that. But it was just like, like the gay bar and how how undeveloped um, Ellie was at the time. Because if do you like maps? Are you a fan of maps? Probably probably not as much as you do. But ah, I could go for a good oh, map. Like oh, I love a map. Yeah, I, I think so. I could be I could be into maps. They look cool when you're looking at them. I don't know. Like Ooh. I look at them and I'm like you know. What do I do, you do like with maps this? In, do, you, <laughs> do you like maps and books? So oh, oh yeah. Them. Who oh. doesn't like maps and books? Those are mm -hmm. the best maps. I can for sure get behind a good book yeah. map. So um, working out just the geography of everything and how the freeway cut LA in half. I mean, it really looks sliced right through neighborhoods. And the where Dodger Stadium is now was like a really vibrant, village, city, town, well, it was a town really. Um, it was a big Hispanic town and they evacuated everybody, sliced the top off the hill and put Dodger Stadium there. And uh, just the way it, you know, the whole city was organized around white people, people in cars, middle-class people, which middle-class were big then. Uh, that, I found that really fascinating. You know? I mean, you're learning a lot about just America in general, just from that yeah. little look at LA. That's super interesting. So yeah. you discussed this earlier as well. I mean, Philip Marlowe, Raymond Chandler, not without controversy. I'll just leave it at that. And I've seen it been referred to as they're a product of a hard boiled time. So can you tell, tell me a little bit more about how you brought this character into the modern world when addressing some of these, these issues? Well, I I just did it very cheekily. I just did it. I didn't try and make it okay for anybody. I just did it. And, uh, you know, there were people then who weren't racist and there were people then who weren't homophobic and there were people then who, I mean, I grew up in a very misogynistic culture, Scotland, uh, you know, Scottish families, Scottish Catholic families were very misogynistic, but there were always men in our family who were not like that. And they were always quite thoughtful people. And, you know, I'm sure most people have gay people in their family. Um, and, uh, you know, there were gay people in my family. Um, so I thought, well, I'm just going to make him not that guy. I'm just going to make just, uh, it is honestly a shift in his values, but I hope it's still him. But he didn't have to be like that. And in the early books, he's not like that. In the early books, he's self-depreciating. He's not bitter. He becomes a bit bitter later on. Um, but there's no mention of, you know, he doesn't make any racist comments in the early books. He doesn't make any comments about women. All the women are not trying to um, get him to um, marry them um, as, they, as they are in the later books, all the women. Everyone comes on to him. Every woman comes on to him in a way that's kind of, it's a bit incel -y. It's a bit suspicious. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I mean, what did he think <laughs> women were doing? <laughs> you know, but I think, uh, I don't think noir had to be like that. It really didn't have to be like that. And, you know, I'm part of a movement of women and gay and um, uh, you know, different writers who wanted to change that, but noir, because, 
you know, like Sarah Paretsky, um, Sue Grafton, all those women before me were writing books that were not like that. And it was because we wanted to change. We all loved noir, but we hated the representations of minorities in those books. And we've been doing it for 40 years and we have changed it. So this book for me felt like it felt like winning the cup. You know, getting That's to do awesome. Chandler. I mean, it really did. It really felt like I started this 25 years ago and I get to do this one and I get to make him be, you know, Marlowe that I don't hate. I don't have to be ambivalent about, him, you know. That's awesome. Okay, people, read this book because that <laughs> passion is definitely in these pages. So speaking of noir, I've always been really interested in noir, but not, I don't know a lot about the genre. I mean, I know there are books, there's films, there's a whole culture around it. And I mean, you have sort of immersed yourself into what noir is. So um, can you tell us a little bit about what it is to you in particular? Because, I mean, it seems like there's a conflicted relationship with what it was and what it's becoming and the evolution of this really complex genre. And I'm pretty intrigued by it because it feels, I mean, it feels like really a pinnacle in crime fiction as a whole, so. Okay, have you got four yes. hours? Okay. I have okay, nothing so to do today. Let's go. Chandler, Chandler <laughs> is doing Dash O'Hammett. He's cosplaying. Playing Dashiell Hammett, the way I'm play, cosplaying Chandler, right? So he's doing Dashiell Hammett with better writing because he was a better educated man. So he puts in these lovely aphorisms, things that Dashiell Hammett didn't tend to do. He just created these really interesting characters. Dashiell Hammett is basically using the house style of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Dashiell Hammett was a Pinkerton detective, and the Pinkerton Detective Agency had this way of writing reports, no adverbs, no adjectives, short sentences, stick to the facts. So that was what he was doing. Then, so then he goes off and he starts writing detective fiction, right? So, uh, I mean, we always think of Hemingway as creating that kind of style and, and people say it comes from newspapers, but actually a lot of things I think come from working class art forms and then are taken up by someone middle class, you know, Edgar Allan Poe didn't invent the detective novel. That was, you know, detective novels were being written by street hawkers and sold as true crime long before Edgar Allan Poe did. He was a newspaper man. That's where he got the idea from. His first few stories were basically true crime transplanted to France because he didn't want to get sued. Um, so they're all copying Dashiell Hammett really and adding on their own little flurries and things like that. But the essence of noir for me the detective novel over here is really about uh, puzzles, you know, puzzle books. So like Agatha Christie, like double guessing the writer, working out what the writer's talking about. But um, uh, the noir detective book is really a social novel in America. So they're talking about social problems. Of course, they're going to change. So the social problems they're talking about um, are different than the social problems we want to talk about now. Um, so the the so they're they're really talking about the corruption at a higher level in society, and they're talking about the way the city operates. And to me, that's a that's a bigger issue. Um, and someone like Dashiell Hammett wrote *The Thin Man*, which was an amazing book, huge at the time. No one ever reads it now. Became an incredibly successful series of books. That was bringing noir and the puzzle book together. I mean, it is a real sort of crossroads. And it features a detective husband and wife. And of course, that leads on to heart to heart. And of course, that leads on to, do you know what I mean? I mean, it's all, all the seeds are there in the early yeah. days of noir. But the, for me, that's what noir is. It's really about the way the city operates. I mean, you do get like uh, country noir and things like that. But there is a kind of pall of depression. And I think there, the depression probably comes from the fact that a lot of the people writing noir were active alcoholics and were very depressed. <laughs> You know, because you do get comedy noir I mean, you do get people writing really, really funny books that, that have that kind of look at the system rather than the individual. Um, and, and so noir kind of looks at the way the system operates and other books sometimes look at the way the person operates. Does, does that make sense? That. Yes, that makes sense. 
Um, you're good at explaining things, but I guess that also makes sense. I don't know if so, you're getting this because you can't see my hands waving about wildly. <laughs> Sorry, I like you. Get, you may be able to hear, but I'm like taking notes as you speak because I'm like, yeah, yeah, I gotta use this stuff. It's great. Um, it's incredibly informative. So, if you were to recommend, let's say three noir books and or films for like beginners who don't i know i'm sorry i'm throwing you curveballs for people who don't have never ventured into the genre they don't know what it is but they want to dip their toes in oh, what would they be three. only three i mean if you've got more we can do a, we can do five well first of all i'm gonna write them down so i don't say them twice <clears throat> first of all i would say uh farewell my lovely which is one of my favorite uh, Chandler books and it's very well written, makes sense, good female characters and really gives you the flavour of a detective on the back foot. So he's, you know, he's not, um, uh, he's not a kind of Superman going about punching people and all that kind of thing. Number two, there's a book called Falling Angel, which was made into a, a film I didn't like called Angel Heart. I don't know if you know that film. Um, it is astonishing and I read it when I was much younger so it might not be astonishing but it had such a big effect on me <laughs> and it's 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 very noir it's very funny um and it's about and then it's slowly sort of changes kind of morphs into this kind of gothic um story it's absolutely oh, brilliant nice yeah it's it is absolutely yeah. brilliant and then I would say the Maltese Falcon I mean, no, if, you're, classic, if you're just starting yeah. off, yeah, it's a classic. And if you're just starting off, it's quite hard to watch the film because everyone's talking so quickly. I don't know if they got paid by the minute back in the day, but, <laughs> but you, know, <laughs> you have to watch with the subtitles on because everyone's <clears throat> gibbering over everybody else. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think they would be great introductions. So that's Farewell My Lovely, which is like the sort of masterpiece of the form. The Maltese Falcon, which is like an origin story for all of these stories because it's so twisty and um, Falling Angel because uh, it shows you what can be done with the form. I think it's it's incredible. Awesome. Okay, I wrote those down, definitely. Um, so where did this all start for you? Your love of books, your love of storytelling? Was there a moment where you were like, this is it for me? Because it seems like you're writing comes intuitively, like, I mean, of course, it, that's what it seems like. I think that's what it's supposed to seem like when you pick up someone's book. Well, that's good editing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I well, you know, Helen was your editor, who's phenomenal. She is amazing. She's absolutely amazing. Well, I'll tell you, I didn't read for a long, long time. And I thought reading was for other people. And I didn't think books were for me. And uh, I couldn't read until I was quite, I was about nine before I could read. Uh, because we moved around and we lived in France and we lived in Holland and you know I just wasn't that interested in that sort of thing and uh, and then I went on a holiday with some girlfriends and it was like a spring break holiday but I didn't know that I thought we were going to Greece to look at churches so I spent that holiday on the roof of the of, can you imagine yeah. I didn't know that people did those things <laughs> I didn't know people wanted to Greece to go look at churches <laughs> Well, we were in this place and it was all, you know, guys with perms and, you know, everyone was drunk all the time. And I was so naive in hindsight. But um, so one of the girls I went with brought 100 Years of Solitude, uh, The Master and Margarita and another book. And I just sat on the roof for the whole week and read those books. And it, and it was quite a contentious holiday. Everybody fell out with each other and like all spring break holidays actually are and there was a lot of crap there was a lot of drama and i was involved in the drama and every so often someone would come up and see me on the roof and i got the suntan of my life and I, actually to, <laughs> I actually got to the airport and I, I thought oh my head's a bit itchy and i went and pulled off oh, my, no. my whole skin peeled off but uh uh anyway i just fell in love with reading and then about a year later i was reading a dick i was reading um uh, a Tale of Two Cities, because I was a waitress. So I didn't really know a lot of people that read and I didn't come from a literary family. And so I was working my way through a, a set of classics. Penguin did this set of Black Spine classics. So I was just sort of reading through kind of, you know, and uh, and I was reading A Tale of Two Cities. I don't know if you remember A Tale of Two Cities at the end is a chase scene. And 
my heart was racing when I was reading this and I started sweating and I thought what an amazing thing to be able to do to tell a story so well that someone is actually sweating a hundred years after you've died now, isn't that that's, that's an incredible thing you know? oh yeah and I thought I thought what a wonderful thing it would be to be a writer but like a lot of people think you know I would like to be a pop star or I'd like to be a movie star I thought that's what everybody felt like being a writer would be but uh it turns out that's not true most people don't aren't really that interested in that sort of thing and um uh but I was so I did a lot of things I did a law degree I did a PhD I was teaching law uh, but in my head I was always a I always thought but well, yeah, I'd love to be a writer that's what I really want to do and uh, and then I got to 30 and I thought you've either got to do it or give up fantasizing about this alternative life so I did it as Bukowski says so I wrote a novel and uh, and that was my first novel, Garnet Hill. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it seems like you've got a pretty interesting life. The I'm not going to lie. Lot. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's great. And you, it feels like you're also just love learning things, which I, I feel like is also reflected in your work. So okay, a lot of your titles that you have written, dozens of works at this point, are they take place in Scotland, where you're from. It seems like you've lived in a, a couple of different places, but I'd love to dig in to how growing up in Glasgow, I think that's for the most part of the city, you can correct me if I'm wrong, how it influenced your writing and your outlook on storytelling. And I'm, I'm always really intrigued to see how people's backgrounds have sort of influenced where they are in life and how they they view the world and how they write and uh, things like that. Well, my dad works in North Sea Oil. He's a draftsman. So I didn't grow up in Glasgow, actually. I grew up in a sort of traveling community of Scottish people and Texans as well. Texans? Texans. Texans. Oh, Interesting. When Texas. When I go to Texas, it's like going home. Oh my goodness! Yeah, really? honestly, yeah. <laughs> and so, and I remember people being told to call their parents "mom" and "sir," and I remember being very angry about it and thinking, "Really, that is oppressing those children." <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in the South too, so I totally. That's how I grew up. Right. Ma'am and sir, and yes and no, just, please just, and thank yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, we had please and thank you as well, but. It was much more egalitarian, I think. You know? <laughs> but uh, anyway, so we lived in Paris with Texans. We lived in Holland. We lived in Norway with a big community of Texans. Because, of course, Texans are the ones who know about oil. So that's why they were there, you know? That makes sense. And, uh, you know, our childhood friends were called Lance and things like that. And um, I used to speak with the Texan accent when I was a kid because they couldn't understand the Glaswegian Oh, I'm, well, you lost it for sure. <laughs> I've, got, I've, got, I've got my Sunday, I've got my Sunday Glaswegian accent on today, but um, your know, Glaswegian just talk a lot. We talk quite quickly, and really don't use consonants that much. You couldn't really couldn't understand. <laughs> so, uh, but um, but we always had a big big family back in Glasgow. You know, like my mum was the youngest of fifteen. So fifteen. Fifteen. Oh, that, that must woman. have been a really fun Ooh. like reunions. You know. Oh, well, I mean. And everybody lives in the same street, more or less. In fact, <gasps> that's kind of cool. Older. I like that. It's so, it's so amazing. And as they got older, they all moved into the same kind of supported accommodation. So they were all. And then my aunt moved out when she was eighty-five because she said, "I don't want to live with all these old people." <laughs> so, um, so I mean, I've got about sixty cousins, and they're all my age, and a lot of them are my closest friends. It's a bit banjos, to be honest with you, but. Um, so, you know, but if you come from a very big family that loves storytelling, everybody fights with each other to be able to tell stories. And, uh, you know, and you, you learn how to do it. I think if you can tell a story, you can, read, you can write a story. So, you know, like people, some people are great at beginnings. Some people go into too much detail. You know, was it a Tuesday? Was it a Wednesday? Oh, shut up, let her tell that story. Um, you know, and you can just watch and watch what works and watch what's interesting and it makes you kind of, you know, very aware of, you know, the way people shape a, a narrative, you know. Uh, so there would be favourite stories of a childhood and they would pick somebody to tell it and they would say, no, you tell that, you tell that. Um, and so, I mean, I think that was very influential. But in Glasgow, being able to tell a good story is a big social thing. Um, you know, like some places uh, are not very, like in London, being a good talker isn't a big issue. But for some reason in Glasgow, maybe it's the Irish influence, I don't know. 
but people are very into storytelling and if you're funny people love you even if you're a murderer they still love you because you're fun <laughs> you know <laughs> just being honest <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i'm not gonna lie i think we need a memoir i think that would work <laughs> out i i would read that it seems really intriguing <laughs> it's too long oh no i think with helen <laughs> it was crime fiction no more, but um so that's that's super interesting okay we're gonna go back to your book for a second because the second murderer for those i'm gonna just highlight this gorgeous cover which i feel like gives the exact vibes that you're getting when you go into this book um what was if you have a favorite scene Oh, listen, Mulholland said sign us up for me more. So I think it should have <laughs> not putting any more on your plate. But um, <laughs> what was your favorite scene, if any, that you had when you were writing this novel? Oh, well, there's a scene when he, uh, when um, Marlowe goes out to, to Malibu and he meets someone who is based on Peggy Guggenheim, who's someone I'm kind of obsessed with. I don't know if you know about Peggy Guggenheim. Tell me about she, Peggy Guggenheim. Oh, what a cool a name. Oh, there's a fantastic memoir of Peggy Guggenheim. So, you know the Guggenheim on Fifth Avenue in New York? Yes. That, that was set up by her uncle. So the Guggenheims were the richest family in the world at one time, but they were the most unfortunate. And people, you know, people died on the Titanic. People died, you know, from cholera. Yeah, they that's had, a really they, interesting juxtaposition. Yeah, they... They, they fell, you know, they fell out of windows. They had the biggest mansion in New York. So she, her uncle Solomon set up the Guggenheim in New York and it's all, it all cuts off. I think he was only buying up to 1890. So Peggy decided to use her fortune to buy modern art. And she, she basically came over to Paris at the start of the war and she bought up everybody's studios. She bought Max Ernst, Brancusi, all these people. She hoovered them all up for no money, packed them into her Bugatti, and then, because she's Jewish, so the Nazis are coming, and uh, she flies off to Spain and manages to get out of the, um, the country. And, but she was basically a bit of a Harvey Weinstein, so she slept with all the, um, the um, artists that she bought. And um, she made Jackson Pollock famous. She had a gallery in New York called The Art of Now, and uh, she showed Robert De Niro's father. I mean, she, she had an amazing, amazing eye, but she was a bit predatory sexually and was a bit all over the place and slept with a lot of people. And uh, uh, anyway, so he goes out to meet her and she's there with her daughter and Peggy's daughter was called Peggy. And they had this very disturbing kind of relationship. It was all very kind of um, codependent and not, not a bit healthy. But anyway, so writing that and imagining Malibu at that time when it was not really populated, I mean, it really wasn't, you know, uh, and how beautiful it must have been and how wild it must have been. Um, I really loved writing that and I, and I built her a house in my head and uh, everything like that. And just to have Marlowe there and he's such a... He's quite rigid morally, you know, and he's in this very kind of borderless, bleedy kind of relationship and it makes him very uncomfortable. And uh, the thing about Peggy Guggenheim was she employed so many people. She was very, very rich. And so many people were depending on her to support them that she had to keep these houses all over the world. Um, and she ended up in Venice. And um, I was going to tell you a dirty story about her, but that's probably not appropriate. No, you can. It's fine. There are only 13 people watching. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you a bit. Now there's two. Um, there's two, had, yeah. Well, we are going to be promoting this afterwards, so. <laughs> she had that. She, it's still there. She had a statue of a man on a horse looking out over the Grand Canal. And he had a detachable erect penis. Um, and when she had... A statue? It's a statue. Yeah, someone's... Two people have left and discussed... Oh, they've gone to Google Peggy Google and, um, erect penis. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and she would take it off when um, when visitors were coming, and then when she was having sex parties, she would put it back on again. So a little brass man on a stone horse overlooking the Grand Canal. So there you are. I mean, she seems like a trip. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> oh, oh she, I can't believe there hasn't been a film about her. She is an amazing, oh, yeah. amazing woman. 
she was in the middle of having a nose job. She wouldn't be, she wouldn't um, go under anaesthetic. She was in the middle of having a nose job and the guy got out the hammer and the chisel and she changed her mind and she made him just soar back up. So she had this really weird nose <laughs> and she disguised it by wearing big mad glasses, but she was a fascinating character. And her, her amazing art gallery was set up to spite her uncle because he wouldn't buy anything after 1890. Interesting. I mean, that does, it sounds movie worthy. I think I'd watch that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I like that the richest family also the most unfortunate. That's really, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's great. Um, are there any genres that you have shifting the gear a little bit here again? Are there any genres that you haven't written in or any stories kind of like this that you had that haven't really been told that you would be interested in diving into? Yeah, I'd love to write horror. Horror, I okay. I, yeah, I love horror. I could do that. Yeah, I really, really love horror. And uh, um, what else would I like to do? Yeah, I'm not sure actually, but um, uh, yeah, probably horror because that's what I watch. That's really what I watch. But I don't read a lot of horror, so that might not be so good. Um, I'm, you know, I also like, I mean, I think genre. I think genre is a marketing thing. I don't think really, as a reader, I don't pick something up because it's in that genre. Do you? I think it depends on what mood I'm in. Because like for, for instance, August 1st for me is the start of spooky season. I am a, I'm a massive horror fan. So like I will intentionally seek out horror books, horror movies, um, so that I and getting in that sort of mindset what? for why why august are you building up for Halloween? <laughs> no. maybe because like, the seasons here since i'm in florida they're not we don't really have proper seasons so instead of like diving into fall i just have to make my own and this is me making my own season so <laughs> i just love halloween as well and i think august is like you know in the stores here you're starting to see some halloween products and mm. Yeah, well, you know, that's mostly corporate greed, but I justify it as, uh, like, people are getting in the spooky mood, you know, we don't have any, any cold, any, like, turning leaves or whatever, but so I just, it's just the, what I want to be in in my house, I can justify putting up creepy things and I love that. only get slightly <laughs> judged by people, they were like, it's August, calm down, and I'm like, every day is spooky season at Novel Suspects. Do you dress up for Halloween? I okay so it's weird I love Halloween so much but I don't ever really leave the house for it no. <laughs> no. you don't have parties or I mean I've awesome. gone to parties but like begrudgingly uh typically I I get really excited just spending all day watching like 20 horror movies and making candy so that I can pass it out to people who never really come because I live in an apartment complex. No one's really knocking on <laughs> the door, but just in case you never know, I get so excited when I hear that knock on the door. I'm, I'm, I'm like a, basically a mom without any kids. <laughs> so <laughs> so what about scariest, what's the scariest film you've ever seen? Oh my goodness. The scariest probably. This is going to sound ridiculous, but probably The Exorcist, like the original Exorcist, which isn't so scary, I think, if you're just watching the film. But I also read the book, and for me, the book is like the slow yeah. burn, insidious feeling. So I didn't know I was creeped out by the book until I set it down. And I was like, wow, this is there's something really just unsettling about it. And um, when I watched I read that and I watched it and I was like, Oh, well, this is like, properly creepy, maybe not like, jump out at you scary or things like that. But what about you? What are you watching? You you watch horror? I watch a lot of horror. And there's lots of really good horror coming out of Scandinavia. I can never remember Ooh, the name of it. Very good, very good stuff. Um, but The Exorcist was the first film I saw with my husband 30 years ago. And uh, we used to go and see it at the late nights once a year. And now I Is see it like my horror? son. He loves horror. Yeah, oh, my my brother brother really loves horror. horror. Oh, no. <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> but that means when we do watch it, he gets way more scared than me. So that's, 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 that part's fun. You know, one of the scariest films I saw recently was, uh, um, oh, 
what's it called? The one where it's just like CCTV film of the house. I'm, oh, I know. Is it like, the... I know exactly what you're talking about. I don't know the name of it though. It's just like you're watching people exist in a house and it's like, oh, what's it called? There's someone it's, it's in the not, comments. It's not... No. Is this someone? Twitter no, I'm the... hoping someone yeah. <laughs> will Google something for us. It's like, um, I can't remember anyway. It's not, it's paranormal activity. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. I went to see that and it was a 15 and uh, so there were a lot of 13 year olds there with makeup on and they were screaming and they were running out and I was so glad because it sort of took the edge off because it was a bit too scary for me. I got quite freaked out. I mean there's <laughs> in the some good movies coming. I know Insidious has a new movie that's coming out um, for I don't know when it's coming out for Halloween. I always thought the Insidious movies were a little creepy. But um, we have a question. Someone asked where the surname Mina comes from. Well, the surname Mina is a, a South Asian first name. So it's like Jane in the South of India. Um, uh, but my name comes from, it's a corruption of Minogue from Ireland. So my son had a DNA test done and it said 50% Irish and the rest is like European Jew. So it's like, well, that's my half. <laughs> um, so, but because it is, it, I say Mina, and I sound as if I'm saying my name's Jane, but you have to pronounce it Jane, because, you know, we have a massive Asian community here. Um, so it sounds like I'm making myself sound fancier than I actually am. <laughs> but it's, uh, it, that's what it is. It's just like my grandfather couldn't write, um, and he couldn't spell, and he said, run off. And they said, me no, and they just wrote it down as me no. And um, actually, my great grandfather died in New York in 1929, and his name was McGerty. And I went to uh, the public library in New York to see if I could find it and his death certificate. And uh, it, it was there, it was written as McGevty because the doctor obviously wrote fast on the death certificate. But uh, that's where the name comes from anyway. But it, it makes me sound much fancier than I am. And I'm actually just bog Irish. Quite sad. <laughs> I'm standing by the memoir. I think that <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm going to stand by it. I'm going to get off, email them all and be like, when is this happening? <laughs> um, so are you working? Are you working on any other books at the moment? Do you see this universe expanding? Is that something I would love it to expand? I'm just putting that out no, there as well. I would love to do that. I'd really love to do that. Um, uh, we'll see anyway. I'd love to see Anne Reardon more. You know, I think she's amazing. And I loved her in the books. And, uh, you know, in Chandler's book, I just thought I want to find out much more about this woman. Um, I think she's really interesting. She's really morally, um, I just love her anyway, but I, but I would love to do that. But I'm, at the moment I'm writing a book called Unthinkable, uh, which is about a forensic, a forensic scientist who discovers that her, her discipline is junk science. And I mean, I don't know if you watched The Staircase. Yes. I, stu I studied forensic science at university when I did law. And a lot of the things that I was taught about then, like forensic odontology, you know, bite marks, a lot of those things are junk science now. And I mean, that's the only reason Ted Bundy was convicted was because of forensic odontology, because of bite marks. You know, blood spatter isn't as reliable as we think it is. Um, you know, there are problems with DNA. There are, you know, but I think every generation has something that they want to believe in absolutely. And uh, what would you do if you discovered that you're whole career and life was based on junk science, making a living, espousing something that wasn't true. And it's really about, you know, getting older and I'm comfortable and, you know, uh, what would it take for me to tell the truth at my own expense at this stage? What would it, you know, I'm thinking about climate change and I'm thinking, you know, my generation really, we're all kind of shrugging our shoulders as if this is the problem of the young and it's really not the problem of the young, it's our problem. And we're the ones that have caused it and we're the ones that have power to do something about it. So I was just kind of uh, thinking about somebody um, who's been manipulated to find someone guilty and she um, has to stand up and she doesn't know. And she's a scientist. I mean, the thing about scientists is, you know, they want to tell the truth. But, I mean, I think that gets forgotten. They're not just finder outers, you know, they're truth tellers. And uh, I think that's really fascinating in a legal context. How do they do that in a legal context? Anyway, I make that sound very dull, but it's basically about a, 
a very rich man who has uh, been found guilty of murdering his uh, parents to inherit all the money. And then she starts to think maybe he didn't do it. Okay, interesting. I mean, there. Are, I love that. I love this idea of you exploring these social issues in your books. And I know that's that has been done before, but I feel like it when it's done in an entertaining way, in a way that, I mean, it's slightly subversive. You're not reading it thinking about its issues until you realize that like this is a part of the story, and you can critically look at the story. I think it's really intriguing. But the thing um, is, all but all books are doing that all the time. So if you think about when I started reading crime fiction in the seventies, in the eighties and nineties. You know, most crime fiction ended with the police finding irrefutable evidence against somebody and shooting the suspect dead in an alley. That is political. That is much more political than anything I've ever written. And but because it's it's the form, everybody just thinks, oh well, you know. Yeah. All that you know, lots there's lots and lots of books about women not remembering properly. My first book was about that. It was about a woman who remembered properly and everybody else thought she remembered wrong. After Me Too, you can't talk about that without that having with that having no meaning i mean of course that has meaning you know yeah. but we tend to think of those things as politically neutral yeah oh, so we have a question um it's let's see i think there are just some comments that say i'm an irish person glasgow delighted to claim you as one of our own and so blissfully happy i've stumbled upon this i'm glad people are enjoying it um, so you did dive into true crime in one of your books. Can you tell, can you tell us a little bit about that one? Um, it's called The Long Drop and it's about a serial killer who was in Glasgow in the 50s. Um, he used to break into people's houses and kill the whole family and then hang around the house, um, which is about the creepiest thing you can possibly do. And he, he, the, the father of one of the first family said he was going to solve the crime and he offered money for information one of the people who came forward with information was the murderer and he said I'll, i don't want the money but i want to meet you for a drink so they met for a drink and they went on a 12-hour bender around glasgow in the 50s they, they went to this bar they got drunk they then drove they drunk drove all around the place they went i think they went to a strip club at one point um and uh uh, and nobody knows what happened that night. And the next time they met, the murderer was on trial for the, the murders. And he decided in the style of all narcissists uh, that he was going to defend himself. So the next time they had a conversation was in the court. And he got the father up and he started asking him about that night. And he didn't want to talk about it. Um, so I just thought, this is an amazing story, you know. <laughs> and uh, so that was the long drop anyway. What type of research goes into that versus when you're when you're doing research for one of your from your fiction novels? Well, it's it's much easier actually because uh, you have to um, you have to tell tell the actual story that as it happened. So real life is not really that believable. That's the thing. It's like real life really un unlikely things can happen. And the characters around Glasgow at that time, there was a guy called Scout O'Neill. And you see photos of him and he's just like a little fat man. But he had so much charisma. Like everyone that ever spoke about Scout O'Neill said, I love that guy. They loved him. And even when he stood up in court and told lies, everybody said, that guy's amazing. <laughs> you couldn't work out what it was about him that was amazing. But um, uh, just the whole culture of it and trying to work out where the city was. I mean, I, I love research and I love maps. And, you know, the, the, our city has been cut in half by a motorway as well. And, um, uh, you know, just reading all the newspapers about it, because, I mean, it was the first big celebrity murder trial. He was, the, he was the second to last person hung in Scotland for murder. And um, everybody interviewed him. He was, you know, kind of well-known character about town. Uh, yeah, so, but I mean, that's the great thing about true stories is that, you know, they are unlikely. And sometimes there are coincidences that if you made them up, they wouldn't really be believable. Interesting. I don't think I'd ever expect someone to say that it was easier, but that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And it's a true, I, I love that. Um, 
Okay, so we're going to wrap up soon. I have one more question before I tell people, buy this book. It is in stores now. And I think that what you did with this novel and the recreation of this sort of legendary detective character is fantastic. I think you certainly give credit where credit is due. Um, so I think I'm just going to finish with curiosity, total selfish question, but if people ever find themselves in Glasgow and they're looking for a good place to eat or a good place to find a book, where, from a local, where are the places that you recommend okay. we should be going? How hungry are you Super, in this hypothetical I mean, scenario? in this hypothetical situation, I just flew from Florida and I am dying hungry. I'm okay. so hungry. Okay, well, the thing you have to remember if you're from anywhere in America is Glasgow's tiny and you can walk from one side to the other in the day. It's really not that big. Go to Finiston and you're going to find a whole lot of restaurants there. Some of them very fancy, some of them not so fancy. You're going to find noodle bars, brilliant little sushi restaurants. There's a strip of amazing restaurants there. Uh, so you're going to eat there and then you're going to go to the junk shop that's up near the bend in the road. That's an amazing junk shop. They sell incredible stuff there. You can have a look. Don't buy anything. You just <laughs> arrive. So you're jet lagged. You just buy rubbish, but go in and look at it. And, uh, and then you're going to go up to the art gallery, which is about half a mile away. And you can have a look around because that's magnificent and um, absolutely brilliant. And you're going to see Glasgow University. Uh, you're going to go for a little walk through the park. We have all the cycle races here to, um, this, this week. So the oh, world nice. cycle races, so the whole city is shut down and there's no cars anywhere and you can cycle oh, anywhere. God, that's really you're nice. Gonna, you're going to rent a bike and you're going to cycle around the West End because the, there's a park and you can basically go from here to the mountains, barely touching road. And, uh, and then you're going to abandon the bike there and get a taxi back and you're going to go to bed because you just got in from Florida. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for for chatting with me today for those i just said it i'm gonna say it again I'm gonna yell it from the top of my small apartment building if you haven't picked up the second murderer definitely pick it up it's in stores now thank you so much it was fantastic talking with you thank you so much for having me and i'm sorry for being so late no of course i mean it's instagram you know i know take what you take okay, <laughs> bye 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 lauren bye thank bye. you everyone <laughs>